Welcome to the Support Automation Show, a podcast by Capacity. Join us for conversations with leaders in customer or employee support who are using technology to answer questions, automate processes, and build innovative solutions to any business challenge. I'm your host, Justin Schmidt. Good afternoon, Zach Wall. How are you doing? Good, Justin. Thanks for having me on. Where does this podcast find you? I am in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of D.C. here in the States. Oh, love it. Yeah, we're here in St. Louis, Missouri, so we're both enjoying beautiful fall colors and jacket weather. Good stuff. So, Zach, tell me a little bit about yourself and then enterprise knowledge and sort of your journey to co-founding that business and what enterprise knowledge does. Sure. So I'll start with the present. Again, it's Zach Wall. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Enterprise Knowledge. We are at present the world's largest dedicated knowledge management consultancy, pure services firm. And how did I get here? So I've been in the workforce for nearly a quarter century. The hairline has crept back, the beard has <laughs> become gray, and I've gotten some cool experience along the way. But uh, virtually all of that journey has been heading towards where I am now, though it was mm -hmm. never as deliberate as I think most people make it out to be. I have degrees in environmental science and political science. So of course, I'm doing knowledge management, right? I started my career right kind of at the dawn of web services. I, I was 98 when I entered the workforce. And I remember my senior year in college, right before then, one of my professors turned to me and said, Zach, have you browsed the world wide web yet? <laughs> and I said, I turned to him, no, professor, what is that? So that kind of gives you a sense of, of what was happening when I came in. The tech boom, an exciting time. But a lot of companies were just trying to figure out how to manage their knowledge, how to manage their digital knowledge. And right. most of them didn't even know the term knowledge management. It's relatively pervasive at this point. But back then, organizations were just trying to get their website to work. So... I entered at a pretty exciting time where though I didn't know any code and I wasn't particularly technical in any sense, I found that I had a particular skill for translating between those who did know how to code and did know the technology and those that had the business problems and the business challenges. So I sort of created the niche for myself in KM before I even knew what KM was. Mm. Worked my way up through my organization, built a practice around knowledge management back in 2013, uh, co-founded EK with my business partner, Joe Hilger. Uh, we've now grown it to over 80 full-time experts in the field, and it's just been a blast. That's awesome. And I'm particularly excited about this conversation, Zach, because having been at the genesis of what the web and then eventually SaaS and, and what and now AI has brought to the workplace and, spe and specifically mm -hmm. to knowledge management, I think you are in the top 0.01% of the world on authority to speak to this stuff. So I think we're going to have a great conversation. Well, cool, Justin. Thanks for setting the expectation. Point zero one percent. Got it. I'm on it. So to to kick things off, I mean, we're this is called the Support Automation Show, and I typically start every interview asking the guest what support automation means to them. And right off the bat, here we're getting into why I'm so interested to talk to you because a lot of times we discuss the sort of like you know, handling a service desk or a help desk ticket, depending on whether you're helping an employee or a customer. Yeah. But a lot of times the work that goes into managing those tickets comes from sort of managing the knowledge within an organization, right? So I'm curious when you hear support automation, what comes to your mind? Yeah, I think before anything else, it's about getting people solutions to their problems as quickly as possible. Hmm. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's as straight a line as possible. It means that it is uh, fast and that it is complete. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of people sometimes mess that up. They say, yeah, this is just about saying somebody calls, they get the answer right away. Or if they self-serve, we deflect that call, whatever it might be. I think it's more than that. I think it's about consistency and completeness of questions answered, of problems solved. Mm -hmm. And that rapid resolution, the, the shifting left into self-service. And, and again, you can I'm gonna use self-service as kind of this bit of maybe an umbrella term 
thinking everything from, you know, HR requests to IT service desk all the way to getting RMAs and trying to find your account balance if you're dealing with customers. Sure. In all these instances, and this is something we find just in our business, and I'm curious your point of view on this too. Oftentimes that knowledge is sort of scattered all over the place, right? Like you have documents, sometimes literal paper documents. Sometimes it's a cloud drive. You have mission critical data in an application that may or may not have an API to make that data accessible somewhere else. And then right. you've got the tacit knowledge or, or tribal knowledge, as it's sometimes called, of just inside people's heads between their ears, right? And when you're working with a client, how do you approach rounding all that up in all those different places and turning that into something actionable for them? So let's first start by talking about the definition of knowledge management. Yeah, perfect. When, when we're talking about KM, we talk in terms of people, process, content, culture, and technology. And I can go through all of that in detail, but to jump to the content piece, we at EK take a very broad definition of what content is, or really what knowledge is for an organization. Traditionally, a lot of organizations have defined that in terms of two things. As you said, the tacit knowledge, what's in people's head, what's mm -hmm. their expertise, what's their experience. And then secondly, all of the organization's unstructured knowledge, the files, the documents, the records that tend to be floating around different applications and, and frankly, share drives. We go broader than that and also include all of the organization structured data, all of the stuff that's hidden within applications, all of those rows and columns of content that are within their CRMs and their financial systems and their people systems. And the reason that we do that is because you can't really master an organization's knowledge until you have all of those materials accessible, findable, discoverable, and connected. And I mm. think that last piece is, is really what we're talking about here, right? The ability to connect all of those different pieces of material, as I technically call it, all of an organization's stuff, regardless of where it is. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, how do we go about figuring out where an organization's stuff is? Well, it's a little bit of detective work. I think that when we first get to know an organization, they tend to underestimate how much stuff they have and how complex it is. We went into one organization recently and they said, yeah, we've got these seven different repositories where all of our content is. And we really want to get down to two or three. So we nod our head and we smile and we think seven. That probably means they've actually got mm, about 21, right? Uh, six months into the initiative, after we had gone through the full audit, we had identified uh, over 100 different places at an enterprise level, at a division level, and then at a regional level where content was being housed, some structured, some unstructured, some officially blessed by the organization, quite a bit sort of ad hoc created by uh, a smaller group. So when we go into an organization, that's an expectation. Uh, that's why people hire us, or one of the reasons is to help identify all of those hidden places where where good knowledge goes to die because yeah. the right people can't get to it. And it's just this like piling up of opportunity cost, right? Of and and lost time searching for all that stuff and asking around and getting stale knowledge or yeah. even worse, completely inaccurate. You're spot on there though, right? I mean, what, what we've found through our various different research is that depending on the organization to 20 to 40% of a knowledge worker's time is wasted because it's spent looking for information or waiting for answers or recreating knowledge that existed within the organization, but of which they were unaware. And so you can start doing the math on that pretty quickly and realize that an effective knowledge management transformation, digital transformation, whatever you want to call it, can yield massive ROI can pay off within a year if done correct. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about, depending on how you're accounting for it, up to a third of your OPEX costs just fixed, you know, right. which is miraculous. 
Well, then you get to add in the CapEx too, right? Yep. Go back to that organization I just mentioned. Uh, if they were managing over 100 different systems, consider the administrative burden, consider the uh, licenses that they yep. don't need to be paying because they had replicate systems. So you can justify one of these transformations pretty easily once you start really getting to know the organization and, and recognizing the inefficiencies. Now, I still don't think I answered your original question. How do we actually do this? So when we go into an organization, uh, we like to talk about things in, in, in terms of a hybrid model. So top down, bottom up. Top down, we want to run interviews and workshops and focus groups with the business, with IT. We really refer to it as a bit of a bingo card. We want to talk with people in all of the different offices and all the different regions. We want to talk with people in all the different functions. And we want to talk with people in all different levels of hierarchy and all different levels of tenure. And if we can complete all the squares in that, I guess, four dimensional bingo card, we tend to discover a lot of these secondary and tertiary stores of, of content and knowledge that the organization maybe hadn't indexed or wasn't aware of. Mm. And then from the bottom up perspective, we approach it from the other perspective. We're actually looking at the content itself. And what tends to happen is when you find some content, it's linking to other content or it's referencing other content. So you find one thing and it's talking about these three other stores of knowledge or three other pieces of information. And then we get to say, well, where are those? And then the organization says, oh yeah, we forgot to mention, or, oh gosh, I don't know. We should probably help you figure that out. And, and that's how you start leapfrogging from one source to many. And that, that was excellent, by the way. Thank you for all that. Sure. You said something in the very beginning that like kind of you did a little bit of a record skip in my head because in my conversations for this show and then just also as doing marketing for capacity, I I haven't heard this before and I want to double click on it. You said culture. Mm. And like the content piece is uh, like sort of the first, you know, the lowest hanging fruit on the, the knowledge management tree. Content makes a ton of sense. Culture is a very, very interesting one. How do you guys look at that? What's the EK yeah. lens at which culture is a part of KM? Yeah, perfect. So you can't succeed in a KM transformation without understanding the culture of an organization and without having people want to share their knowledge or feel rewarded for sharing mm -hmm. their knowledge. So when we're looking at culture, First of all, we're assessing what the natural culture of an organization is. Is it internally competitive or is it internally collaborative? Is the leadership of the organization modeling the right knowledge sharing behavior? Are they rewarding it? Are they incentivizing it? Or is it sink or swim, everybody, each person for themselves sort of culture that's being modeled? There are impediments to sharing knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. within an organization. And, and there tend to be three big ones and they all have a cultural element to them. The number one reason people don't share knowledge within an organization is because it's hard. If your systems aren't designed and your processes aren't designed to share knowledge, people generally aren't going to do it. They're going to take the path of least resistance. They're going to send something as an attachment in an email or they're going to stick something on a hard drive. The number two reason is because knowledge is power. And as long as an employee holds on to that knowledge, they have the power. They're essential and they, they won't get fired. And the number three reason is that uh, they're afraid of getting in trouble. Maybe they share something that their boss doesn't like or that is counter to how the organization wants people to be talking about how they do the thing. Mm. So you can pull that apart and you can see for all three of those reasons, there's a cultural element to it. There's a human element to getting people to want to share knowledge, to be unafraid to share knowledge, to feel rewarded for sharing knowledge, to feel that they can become more powerful within the organization by being seen as the person who shares, who collaborates, who innovates through the sharing of knowledge. And, mm. and so that's really how we look at that lens. You sort of mentioned a few things when we were scheduling this conversation. Yeah. And when KM and knowledge management, which we just covered, the second thing you mentioned was knowledge graphs. And is that also, in your view, a multifaceted construct where you've got technology and connections there, the people, the connections there? I, I would love for you to sort of double click on 
the concept of knowledge graphs, how EK views that, and where you find enterprises are driving value from managing it properly. Yeah, this is pretty exciting, Justin. We're having a lot of fun with this, and I'm, I'm really proud that EK is at the forefront of this work. We're really putting this into production for a lot of our clients. So knowledge graphs, graph databases, what we're really talking about here is taking a graph database and mm -hmm. applying an ontology against it. So an ontology might be a new term for some of your listeners. It's effectively a three-dimensional model of relationships within the company. So a really simple one is Zach works at Enterprise Knowledge. Enterprise mm -hmm. Knowledge is expert in knowledge management. So we can infer that Zach is an expert in knowledge management. When you take those sorts of relationships, subject, predicate, noun, you can build a web for all of the knowledge within an organization. You can break down barriers across different repositories of knowledge, different applications and systems, different types of knowledge, and you can include in that the unstructured, the structured, and the other types of knowledge that exist, including your people themselves. So what this results in is if architected properly and instantiated in the right application, be that search or navigation tool or a chatbot or whatever else, mm -hmm. an ability for the organization to do a few things. One is to apply some natural language processing against it and have the average business person or the average customer or client ask plain language questions and mm -hmm. get answers that are assembled from multiple sources within the organization. But another is taking findability to the next level. Findability being my favorite made up word in our industry, but it really basically means that somebody knows what they're looking for and we help them get it as quickly as possible. With a knowledge graph, you can take that a lot further. Somebody can kind of have an inkling of the question that they're trying to get answered they're tr or can get kind of a sense of what they're looking for Mm -hmm. And a graph database will help them discover new knowledge within the organization. I go looking for a simple answer to a question that I have. I get that quickly. And then the tool also says, now, here's a learning module that you can watch in order to become more proficient in this. And here are the three primary experts within the organization on this topic. And here's some data from our CM CRM that backs up the answer that we just got you. And here's a course that you can sign up to take, so on and so, so forth. You can go to each of those sources, and then you can discover additional knowledge branching from those different points. A knowledge graph is going to help you discover things that you didn't know to go looking for. Yeah, that is only something you can do after that discovery of where all that knowledge is and, and, and what is it, right? So yeah, the knowledge graph and the depth of those connections, recommendations, and related concepts that you just described there, none of that's possible without the legwork up front of mapping everything out and, and doing the discovery on the KM situation within an organization itself. Totally, but there's a big yes and there. Yes. And that, that yes and is, it's not just about knowing where the, the content is, it's about ensuring the content is right. And so here's the second big challenge to making knowledge graphs work for the organization. It's not just about knowing where the stuff is, it's about ensuring that that stuff is accurate and correct. So what we tend to find is most organizations are managing about five times more stuff than they should. Four out of five documents mm. are old, obsolete, outdated, just plain incorrect, or duplicate or near duplicate. And so this is very much the garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. You can build the coolest ontology knowledge graph that anybody has ever seen. But if you're just connecting your users to bad information, then it's worthless. And that's one of the big issues that a lot of organizations are encountering. Yeah, there is a, it's a unique challenge, I think, in modern era where the creation of content is so easy, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like ephemeral, but also not, right? And, and Slack is a good example of this, right? And I, I'm sure anyone or, or teams, but let's pick on Stuart and Benioff here. 
you can have a conversation with Slack about the same thing with four different people five different times. And then you've basically got like 20 sort of key value pairs there on, you know, what is it and then the knowledge you needed on that. Yeah. And it's, uh, good luck sort of searching for that right? and, and remembering right. the context in which it was delivered. And, you know, then you're like, oh, okay, well, I should probably go check XYZ document or database or whatever. And then that contradicts the 20 conversations you just looked up in the history. And it is an issue. And this is where it's, things get really exciting for me because the even concept of creating like the ontological map of knowledge graph in an organization isn't possible without technology. Managing all this it becomes really fascinating when you layer artificial intelligence on top of it, mm -hmm. which was the third piece of your statement that we were going back and forth with before the show. And is also most relevant to us as capacity being an AI powered support automation platform. So this is the spot of the conversation I was most looking forward to talking to you about. Where do you see AI fit into this puzzle? How are you, you all approaching it? And what do you think the future holds? I mean, we're doing AI. It's just probably not the AI that most people pictured when they were watching Back to the Future for the first time, right? right. <laughs> so self-driving cars, yeah, they're on their way, but that's not what we do. What we're really talking about here is more of the Alexa or Siri kind of AI. There's this concept of black box AI where the tool just kind of does something and gets you the answer and you don't know how. But what we're talking about is explainable AI. Mm. The graph has the logic that you can very much trace and understand and see where these answers came from or why you're getting the recommendation or how something was assembled. And so in, in our world of knowledge management, this is the greatest value the organization has. They don't just want the answer. They want right. to know the how and why of that answer. So explainable AI is, it's, if done correctly for an organization, a massive competitive advantage, uh, massive productivity enhancer. And frankly, I don't see it going away anytime soon. I think it's how business will be done for the most mature organizations. 100%. Now, it's happening today. I think a lot of the work that we're doing presently it is exactly that. It's just being done in a very agile fashion. So a lot of organizations have not yet achieved an enterprise knowledge AI or enterprise AI solution, as we call it. But they are choosing data sets. They're choosing small segments of an enterprise ontology to focus on in order to solve very pointed and specific business challenges. So over the next couple of years, what we anticipate is those six month or year long projects that we've done to help organizations prove that this works will grow to the enterprise level. The technology is going to get better. It's already pretty cool. Uh, but more than that, these solutions will become more enterprise level for organizations. They'll truly be able to not just ask the question that the tool is trained to answer, but mm -hmm. really ask a, a much broader set based on kind of the enterprise, based on the business. Right. The thing that always comes up when people think about AI in making decisions and helping us make decisions is bias and bias in, in AI and NLP models can, can really, and they're just any sort of machine learning model really, but oftentimes there's, when people say bias, I think sometimes they mean one thing, but it really is another bias in terms of something like, I don't know, resume screening. Mm -hmm. Like the fear is that the model will be biased against a particular ethnicity or, or, or gender or whatever it is there's sort of like an emotional impact of bias and there's also just the mechanical, like this is mm -hmm. you know, the, the data was overweighted. How can enterprises manage that? Is this the kind of thing that is the answer simply like you do the fundamentals of KM, build your knowledge graph correctly, and we can minimize the impact of bias? Or is this a separate sort of thing that you have to do along the way on the process? Yeah. So if we're talking about your latter definition, this is manageable 
by the organization with the right methodology and the right approach. And again, it's about not just relying on your existing models and your existing content. Mm -hmm. If you're relying on all of your existing stuff and your existing thinking, then you're going to reinforce the biases that already exist within the organization. And some of them are there for a reason. They might be right. Right. Some are obviously not and are hindering the business from performing at the level and frankly, making these tools work in the way that they should. And so a big part about this is about challenging assumptions, not reinforcing the wrong or right assumptions of the past, asking the question of each one, is this the way the business should be operating? Is this the way we should be answering these questions? Not just, is this the way we used to answer the question? So I actually think that you can look at this as an opportunity. If you're going through the process of redesigning your information architecture, your taxonomies, your ontologies, you're remapping knowledge within the organization, you get the opportunity to ask those crazy big questions that say, should we be doing it this way? Should we be thinking about it this way? Is this the way our customers want to get answers? Is this the way our employees want to learn? What a cool opportunity to yeah. get to work with an organization to ask those questions and come to the right answers. Uh, that's one of the reasons I love my job. <laughs> if you were to give one piece of advice to an executive or an executive team who's starting to look at this problem in their organization, and by this problem, I mean they have scattered knowledge People are wasting time, not talking about bias anymore, but just knowledge management in general. If you were to talk to an executive or a leadership team who's just getting ready to look at this, what would be the what would be your piece of advice on where to start? Yeah, start with the problems you have today and the way you want them solved in the future. So a lot of times, this is hot stuff, right, mm-hmm. Justin? I mean, a, a lot of organizations are calling us and saying, we need a knowledge graph or we need AI. And that's great. That's wonderful. But we need to help those organizations also say why they need the knowledge graph, why they want AI, what problems they're trying to solve. And so it seems so basic, but a lot of organizations are just missing that why right now. Mm. Who needs it? What do they want to do with it? What are the outcomes that you're seeking for the organization? How are we going to measure the success of this transformation for you? Those basic questions, a lot of folks think they know the answer to, but when they compare their notes with the person sitting next to them within the organization, there tends to be a lot of, well, a lack of alignment. And so oftentimes we'll go into an organization, the first thing we're going to do is help with those use cases, help with the, the, the personas, help with that alignment to ensure that everybody's swimming in the right direction. Yeah, I bet those are some electric early meetings. They uh, certainly challenge our ample facilitation skills. <laughs> Yeah, I, there's few things that can get derailed, like the sudden realization that a leadership team is not aligned on something, right? <laughs> like if if you have a meeting agenda and that happens 15 minutes in, it's an hour long meeting, you can forget about the, the other 45 minutes being productive. But this is, you're right. And this dovetails with something that we tell people often. And that is, you know, I have this, I can pick a microcosm of something process that needs to be automated. It's like, okay, Maybe, but evaluate what it is, ask why, evaluate what it is you're trying to accomplish, map out the process in the first place. And you may find that there are just simple, like, you know, efficient organizational management 101 or process design 101 things that you could do to make a drastic impact on what you're doing. And then either A, you may not need the tool you were looking at in the first place, or you're going to set yourself up for a hell of a lot more success with the investment you're about to make, right? It's really amazing to me that we have, we've gotten so good at solving so many problems. We have developed some of the craziest technology that to even someone 50 years ago would look like absolute magic. An iPhone, give an iPhone to someone in the 1940s and the brain's gonna ooze out of the side of their ear. How about the 1990s? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But so many of the problems that this technology is solving is just rooted in like 
fundamental human behavior and organizational skills that are just hard to maintain as a group of people working towards a common cause grows, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So what is the, what's the next big thing that you feel leaders should be looking out for when it comes to knowledge management? Is it just the AI getting better? Is it, is like the, the digital transformation wave mostly you know, completes and then it's the second step. I'm just curious where you think the broader future of knowledge management is going. Sure. So, you know, again, it goes back to our definition, people, process, content, culture, and technology. It's the effective melding of all five of those things across the entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. And even 10 years ago, the technology wasn't there. A lot of organizations knew what they wanted to do with it, but the technology wasn't capable of doing it from a tagging perspective, from a management perspective, from an enterprise search perspective of bringing everything together, structured and unstructured, certainly from a graph perspective of assembling content and making recommendations and from a NLP and machine learning perspective of kind of talking with you and giving you the answers. All those concepts have existed for a long time, but the technology is finally there. So from a KM perspective, what the organization be looking at would be, are we prepared to leverage the technology that is finally ready for us? And for most organizations, the answer is not yet. It goes back to the point that I made about content. Most organizations don't have their content house in order. They need to clean up their content. Most don't have the appropriate tags or structure on their content. Most don't have the appropriate governance in place around their content or their systems to manage all of this effectively. They might put a cool technology in place. Without all of those foundational elements of knowledge management, they're not going to be able to realize the ROI on it that they're seeking. Mm it's not going to do the thing that they want it to do, at least not right or well. So where most organizations should be, and most leaders in those organizations should be asking what I would say are three core questions. One, do we have the right foundational elements of knowledge management in place to achieve AI, to uh, achieve the value out of the technology? Right. Two, do we have the right organization or organizational elements in place to lead that and to sustain it? This isn't anybody's part-time job. To do this well, it needs to be focused and dedicated. And then number three, do we actually have a clear understanding, like I said, of the problems that need to be solved so that when we are ready from both the foundational perspective and the technology perspective, we can say go. We can say, let's solve this problem first. Let's prove that we solved that problem with the right measures so we can plant the flag of success and go solve the next three problems. And organizations are getting there. I mean, the maturity around KM and all of the things that we've been talking about here, Justin, are, are certainly better than they were a few years ago. And I'd like to think that EK has had a, a healthy hand in that. But there's some work to be done. And that's obviously where we come in. Yeah, this has been an amazing conversation, Zach. Yeah. I can't thank you enough. And let's end with our little quick fire round here. What's the book you most often recommend to people? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a, from a work perspective, I'm a big fan of uh, the Trusted Advisor. I think that it's a good I, one. There are there. I've read all the management books and all the consulting books, and I I believe that to be one that holds a lot of truth and is very actionable in how it it gets across. So that would be my recommendation from that side. And then. Boy, I guess from a fun perspective, well, I'm reading The Last Days of Night by Graham Moore right now. That's a pretty good one. I don't think I have, I guess, East of Eden would be mm -hmm. my favorite book of all time. So there you go. Yeah, that is a classic. You're right about a lot of management and, and consulting and sort of business books, right? It's interesting that when you find one that clicks, it really clicks. You know what I mean? It's, it, you, otherwise, you kind of get excited while you're reading it or maybe you jot some notes down, but then nothing, things fade. But certain ones do stick, right? And that's why I love that question because you end up getting this collection of books that do stick and it makes for a good resource for people. I add every answer to guests ever give me to my reading list and eventually get to it. So I'll really, you know, I, what I'll say is I, I can tell you, in my opinion, what the difference is between the good ones and the bad ones tell you who to pretend to be and the good ones tell you how to be authentic and who you are. That is very well put. What's the best productivity tip you've ever received? 
it's really simple. I take my email and I keep things unread that need to be done. Hmm. And so I always be every morning and at the end of every day, I check every unread email that I have. And my type A checking off the list is triaging those things and saying, hey, the, the, the ones that can be done in five minutes come first, the ones that can be done in an hour come next, the ones that take a, a day I need to plan for, and the ones that take a week I need to block time for. And it all starts with an unread email. I love it. We do a webinar once a year of this giant listicle of productivity tips and stuff. And one of the, we've, the, the two or three years we've done it, I refuse to move this out of the first, it's literally the first thing I do in the webinar is find a system to manage your email and become that system, right? Like don't stray from, if, if you say I'm gonna check my email in the morning and the afternoon, if you commit to inbox zero on the every, you know, at the end of every day, whatever it is, right? Like commit to it and go all in because there, there is nothing that can derail a day like a rabbit hole of email. If there is one website, blog, uh, LinkedIn group, Slack community, Facebook group, or, you know, before 2020, when we used to get together in person a lot, real life community, that you could recommend for someone who's interested in solving these kind of problems, what would it be? Yeah, so uh, here in DC, there's a, a KMI, Knowledge Management Institute, community practice and group. We used to host the meetings in the before times. And I hope we will again in the future. But for the KMers out there, for the practitioners, that's absolutely a great one. It's on LinkedIn as well. So you, you, you can join it virtually in advance of ideally rejoining in person. Love it. And finally, if you could take anybody out for a coffee or a cocktail, depending on the time of day, to pick their brain to be a better leader, who would it be? Yeah, you know, I, I think I would need to go with, with Jeff Bezos, not necessarily because I agree with everything uh, he has done, far from it, but he's built something that is incredibly powerful. And, Can't argue with the results, uh, yeah. There were a lot of years of failure there, and he stuck with it, and I think that's pretty incredible. And I would love to hear that story firsthand. 100% agree. That would be an hour of time very well spent. Well, Zach, thank you so much for coming on the Support Automation Show. Where can people find you, Enterprise Knowledge, and learn more about you or your company? Yeah, www.enterprise-knowledge.com. Uh, we have a free and open knowledge base of thought leadership, literally hundreds of blogs and white papers and videos. Uh, you can also find me on the Knowledge Cast podcast, uh, either via our site or online. Love it. Thank you so much for coming on the Support Automation Show, and you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me. Cheers. The Support Automation Show is brought to you by Capacity. Visit Capacity.com to find everything you need for automating support and business processes in one powerful platform. You can find the show by searching for Support Automation in your favorite podcast app. Please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Capacity, thanks for listening.